Hello there. I'm Justin Fluger, and I'm a senior solutions engineer at Fermion. And at Fermion, we build a serverless functions platform that's powered by WebAssembly. Uh, you may have heard of WebAssembly before. Uh, it's a bytecode format. It executes in a secured sandbox runtime uh, at you, when you're using Spin, um, which is made by Fermion. Uh, that is built on top of WASM time. WASM time was built by the Bytecode Alliance, who has also been driving the WASI specification. And that's what enables uh, the kind of server-side WebAssembly um, execution. Uh, and um, we'll also be kind of marrying that with the Kubernetes ecosystem today. Um, so Kubernetes, if you're familiar with it, uh, is a pretty strong orchestrator. A lot of people have have used it before. A lot of uh, customers that we've talked to and folks that we've talked to at KubeCons in the past um, are all kind of interested in, you know, taking advantage of uh, running server-side WebAssembly um, because it does allow you to be a little bit more resource efficient with your um, Kubernetes environments um, because it executes in a similar manner to a Docker container, um, but it doesn't have the kind of base layer of the operating system. So um, it starts up a lot faster because it just gets straight to your application code. Um, yeah, so that also means that that it does scale pretty pretty quickly. Um, which is which is also pretty nice if you have you know some bursty workloads in Kubernetes um, that you're trying to orchestrate. Um, so let's uh, kind of dig in here. Uh, so some of the things that that you'll need uh, if you're following along, um, you'll need a Kubernetes cluster. I have one that's set up on on Cibo, um, and you'll also need kubectl, uh, Helm, and uh, Fermion Spin. Um, and then for our programming languages today, we'll take a look at Rust, Go, and um, JavaScript. Um, so, how does how we enable uh, WebAssembly uh, workloads in in Kubernetes is that it's built on top of a ContainerD shim, um, and that ContainerD shim that we'll be using today is is built by the Deus Labs team at Microsoft. Um, and the way that it works is that when uh, Kubernetes gets a, a request to schedule a pod, it sees that that pod uh, has a runtime class um, for um, our container D shim, and uh, then it finds the container D shim that's on the node and hands off that WebAssembly module uh, to the shim, um, which gets executed. And so the next thing we'll we'll have to get going is um, we'll have to get those shims onto our Kubernetes nodes, um, and we'll do that using the KWASM operator. It makes it really simple uh, to get those container D shims installed on your Kubernetes nodes. Um, It'll just be a quick Helm install, and then we'll be off, off and running. Um, and for our development tool, uh, we'll be using Spin to kind of create our application and build it, test it locally, and then push it up to a container registry. And then uh, we'll jump into kubectl to kind of uh, deploy that. Cool. So let's get into some of the code here. Uh, so the first thing uh, that we'll need to do, you know, there's nothing in this repository. I've got some Terraform in here uh, for Sivo. Um, if you wanted to deploy there, um, you know, it can also be Azure, Kubernetes, um, EKS, you know, wherever. As long as there's a, uh, it's a container D based um, Kubernetes distribution, it should just work. Um, yeah, so there's nothing else in here. So we'll go ahead and create our, our spin application. Um, and we'll just create it in this in this directory. So we'll initialize a new application. I like to use the uh, our HTTP empty template. Uh, it makes it easy to kind of add more functions as you go. Um, and we'll give it a name here: uh, CNCF Wasm Webinar. Yep, we're going to overwrite our git ignore. I think. Give it a quick description, and we'll see. Uh, you know, in source control, there's only one file that gets created, and that's our spin tunnel. So that is for spin applications. This is kind of our, our application manifest, and this is the way that we wire up uh, different WebAssembly modules to different routes. Um, so if you're using just kind of the HTTP empty template, um, there's really nothing in here to get started with. So um, let's go ahead and add our first. Uh, our first uh, WebAssembly module. Oh, do spin add. 
because um, we already have the existing um, spin manifest here. We'll start off with Rust. Rust has pretty good support for WebAssembly, so it's it's kind of a tier one language for us. It's what Spin is built on. Um, it's also what um, Wasm Time is built on as well. I'll just give this a description. Um, and then the next thing that it's asking for here, HTTP path uh, with the three dots, that's a wildcard route. Um, so if we wanted this uh, function to handle every request that um, hits uh, our application, we could leave it like that. But I'm going to use a couple different programming languages today. So I'm going to give it a, a sub route. We'll just call it RS for Rust. And here we go. We can see that a couple of things got added here to our Stentomal. Um, so the first thing is our HTTP is an HTTP trigger. Um, and it's called Rust Funk because that's the name that I gave uh, Spin. Um, and it picked up our route. Um, so that's the slash RS slash wildcard. So anything uh, after RS will get routed to our uh, Rust module here. Um, and then, you know, looking deeper in into this component Rust Funk, um, you know, this source is just a WebAssembly module. It's just a path. Uh, so this is where when you run a cargo build, this is the output path for it. Um, and if you do have Rust installed, uh, you'll need to um, install the uh, WASM32 um, WASI target. So um, just make sure we've got that installed. I'm pretty sure I do. Already up to date, so we're good there. Um, and then you know, under this build uh, portion here for this component, um, we just give it a command. So spin itself doesn't actually build your application. Um, we're just using Cargo to kind of build our application. Um, and then the working directory for us is Rust Funk. So let's go take a look at that. Um, so this is a pretty standard uh, Rust um, project. Uh, this is our Cargo Toml, which has our dependencies in here right now. It's just anyhow, um, which helps you kind of handle errors uh, pretty nicely. And then the Spin SDK. I'm using Spin 2.2, uh, which is the latest. Um, and then let's take a look at the source code. So this is all of our source code here, uh, just one function um, with this HTTP component attribute. Um, and uh, all it's doing here is, is it's logging out the request header when it gets a request in, and it's writing hello for me on. Let's update that. Uh, let's call it hello CNCF webinar. Cool. And then let's uh, go ahead and build our application. So instead of typing, you know, cargo build uh, with target and everything, um, you can just use a spin build, and that's going to compile our app um, for Rust into a WebAssembly module eventually. Great. So that's built. Um, and then let's just make sure everything's working. So we'll do spin up. That's how you kind of start the local development server. And um, cool. So it's listening on this route. We'll open up a, another terminal here. And we'll do a curl. Right port and give it that RS path. Great. It says hello, CNCF webinar. Um, perfect. So that one is done. Let's add that to our Git repository. Great. Back to no changes here. So just for funsies, let's add a couple more. Uh, we'll go with the JavaScript one next. And we'll just call it JS Funk. Give it a quick description following the same pattern. We'll give it a, a JavaScript path on our application. And since it's um, uh, JavaScript, and we are using NPM to kind of manage our packages. Um, we will go into that directory and install our dependencies.
and it looks like I need to set up yeah. Okay, it's a little it's a little early over here, so still still drinking my coffee. Cool. We've got NPM on our path. Seems like I need to update my um, LRC. Cool. So we've got all of our dependencies installed. Let's go back up to our spin directory where our TOML file is, rerun that build. And then while we're doing that, we'll take a look at what changed in our application manifest. So similar to the Rust function here, um, we just added the JavaScript function. Um, and we're just pointing it at the uh, output from that. Um, that's a WebAssembly module. And when we reran spin build here, it did go through the um, NPM or the node build, and it also ran through the Rust build again. So everything should be up to date. And great. So we've got a Rust function, we've got a JavaScript function. Cool. So that says hello from JS SDK. And let's go take a look at the source code. I'll change it again. We'll make sure we know which um, <laughs> which endpoint we're hitting when we call it. Let's do that. Rust as well. And then wrong shell again. So with this command, um, I ran spin build, but since I know I want to run up right right afterwards, I just gave it the dash dash up argument. And then we'll double check. Yep, our message got updated, so that's good. And then one more, uh, we'll use go this time. So we'll call it a go func. This is actually built using TinyGo. Uh, so TinyGo has a target for uh, WASM32 WASI. Um, Golang will eventually have a full support for it, um, and they're currently working on imports and exports right now. Uh, one of those may already be done. I don't follow uh, the Golang issue as religiously as some of our other engineers. TinyGo serverless function. We'll give it a path. I'll rerun that build. Cool. Test it out again. So many sanity checks. Never know what's going to go wrong. Okay, so we took a look at our Go or our JavaScript function already. Let's take a look at our Go function. Oh. So pretty basic um, Go uh, application. I think the only difference here is that in the init handler is where we kind of wire up our, our Go handlers. Um, and let's change, update this message to be similar to the other ones. Rerun the build and get that updated message. And our other functions are all still working, so I think we're I think we're ready to deploy this. Uh, so uh, the next thing we'll do is um, we're going to take this application uh, and we're going to uh, first I'm going to commit my changes. Push them up so they're public. Um, here's the, uh, the GitHub URL. 
um, if you're following along and want to take a look at the code, um, it's under my GitHub handle slash CNCF WASM webinar. Um, you can find all the code there. Cool. So in order for Kubernetes to kind of execute this, we'll need to get it into an OCI uh, repository. Um, so uh, one, one easy way to do that um, is there's a command in spin to do a spin registry push. And then I've been using ttl.sh lately um, to just have kind of an anonymous um, OCI registry. Give it a reasonable tag. <clears throat> Everything's pushed up to our registry. Um, so as far as I know, I think we're, we're good to start working on some Kubernetes manifests. Oh, the fun. Lots of YAML coming at you. We'll create a directory for it. And so the first thing we'll do is create our deployment file. Um, and this will be a pretty basic uh, deployment. So. I love snippets. Fill out all my stuff for me. Okay, so let's take our name here and go through and update it. We won't need actually the ports and I'm just gonna remove the resources right now. Um, you can put resource requests and limits on there. Um, all of that, all of that works, and it gets passed through to the container D shim, um, which does respect all those all of those limits. So, um, great, we've got all of our names, labels set. Let's set our image name. Tag, um, and then we'll also have to give it a command. Uh, this can really be anything. Um, the container D shim doesn't actually use this because it looks up the spin tunnel file, um, and then it will find the subsequent uh, WASM um, modules that are in there uh, using that spin manifest. So I think let's give it an image poll policy. Okay, so this is a basic deployment, um, and this would work if uh, we were just running a regular Docker container. Um, but since we're going to be using the container D shim, um, we're going to give it the name of a runtime class, and this is kind of how we'll wire up um, uh, the container D shim to be able to execute this uh, specific image. So we'll call our runtime class wasm time spin v2. We actually haven't created our runtime class. So let's go ahead and do that now. Uh, runtime class YAML. And I've got the template here for this one. It's really simple. Um, if you've used other uh, runtimes before, like GVisor or anything, you've uh, had to do this, or um, Helm has done it for you. Um, so we'll just match up this name to our deployment file. Go side by side here. So we've got a runtime class name that'll match up with this runtime class name, and uh, the handler here. Uh, this does have to be spin, um, just because the name of the container D shim is follows a pattern where it's container D dash shim dash spin, and then V two uh, corresponds to the container or the uh, container D uh, spec, I believe, something like that. Great. So we've got a runtime class. Let's go ahead and apply our runtime class. Looks like I had one left over in, in this cluster. Let's make sure I don't have anything else left over. Nope, I'm good. Uh, cool. So those are the two basic things we need to get this running. Um, or to wired wired up to the container DSHIM. 
Um, so the next thing we need to do is get our container DSHIMs actually installed onto our um, Kubernetes nodes. So um, if we just take a look at our cluster, this is a basic three node cluster. Uh, it says K3S, but it's actually running on Sivo Cloud right now, which uses K3S. Um, so yeah, well, it's the next the next thing we'll do is use KWASM to install the container DSHIM. Um, and for that, we'll use Helm. So if we do a Helm repo add KWASM, copy paste this one in here so I don't mess it up. Um, so this is the KWASM operator. You can also find that at github.com slash KWASM slash KWASM operator. So this is the Helm repo already exists because I've installed this before. And then we'll do a Helm install. We'll let it create the namespace. Give it a namespace, we'll just call it KWASM. And um, I'm gonna set a Helm value here that I know and it's called auto provision. Um, and so there's two modes that, that KWASM works in. Um, one mode is an auto provision, which we'll use here. Um, where it will uh, listen for every node that gets added to your Kubernetes cluster, and then it will add the container DSHIM um, to those nodes as they kind of get added. Um, the other uh, way, if you have like a node pool that you want to um, install specifically on, um, you can annotate those nodes, um, and KWASM will filter based on those annotations. Um, but I'm gonna be a little lazy here and just uh, auto-provision the whole cluster. So we'll give it a Helm release name and point it at our repository. Cool. And then here, I'm just using an alias that I have to change the Kubernetes context to use the KWASM namespace uh, that was just created. We can see that the KWASM operator is running uh, let's get the logs for that. Cool, so it looks like it started. And usually it, it deploys some jobs here, so um, maybe it already sees that I have run this demo before. <laughs> And uh, these nodes are already provisioned, so let's take a look at one of the nodes just to make sure. And what we're going to be looking for here is a label. Um, check and see these are our annotations and our labels. Maybe I fat fingered the Helm install. I'm going to uninstall and uh, reinstall because I think that I typed in that Helm value wrong. So. Sure, it's not in there anymore. Cool. Back to the KWASM namespace. Let's say that auto provision nodes is enabled. Hmm. Not saying the KWASM labels in here. 
just probably because I've run through the demo a couple of times um, just to make sure that everything's working. Um, so let's take it a step further. And let's, uh, since we have Chaosm installed, we've got the deploy installed or the deployment file written. So let's go ahead and apply this and see if it throws an error. I am in the wrong namespace. So we'll create that deployment in the default namespace uh, so we don't pollute that KWAS in namespace. Cool. So it says it's running. You know, I think. Um, I, I just had the shim already installed. Um, usually what you would see in there is some messages um, from KWASM that says that it has added the shim in there, but since it probably found that shim already, um, it um, didn't log anything out for us. So let's just make sure that our application is running. And we'll port forward from our local port 3000 to port 80. We'll create another terminal here. Cool. So that should be uh, running in our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you can see that our port forward handled that. Um, so. Let's take it a step further and uh, add in some um, replicas. Add in a couple more replicas, uh, and then we'll add in a, a service. All right, up and running. And next thing we got to do is create our service definition. So call this CNCF WASM webinar. Uh, we'll use port 80 here. Um, by default, the container DHM will always use uh, port 80. Uh, but you can always give it uh, your service a different port. Uh, we can make this 3000 if we wanted to, but for simplicity, we'll just uh, pass through that, um, that 80 port. TCP protocol. Cool. I think that's all we need. Let's make sure that is also up and running. Great. So we got our service deployed. Um, it should be uh, load balancing to our three replicas. And the next thing we want to do is be able to access our application from um, outside of our cluster. So we'll add an ingress. And this will be a pretty basic ingress. Uh, we'll give, just give it the same name. Host, um, we don't have a host here, so we're actually going to use a different version of this spec. So um, instead of doing a bunch of rules, uh, which we don't really need for this sample, we'll give it the default backend, and we'll just point it at our service. That should be enough to get an ingress going. Great, 
Now, usually you'd wait until uh, you get an address for this ingress. Um, and in my testing with Sivo's um, K3S distribution, um, this doesn't get populated, but what we can do is look at our uh, load balancer that got provisioned. Um, so I have some um, Terraform over here under Infra Sivo. Uh, one of the outputs over here is going to be our load balancer domain. So uh, that gets mapped uh, through env to the endpoint. So let's take a look. Go endpoint, and we'll do a curl HTTP endpoint, and we'll give it the rest. Cool, that's working. Great, so we have our externally available service now. So I'll just type, all, type this all out. Great, um, so that's, um, that should be all publicly available. So that's that's it. That's all we had to do to get, get everything kind of up and running here. Let's um, add all this to the Git repository. Now let's do a, a quick load test. Um, so I've just been using this uh, A tool to run a quick test. Uh, it's a pretty simple tool, um, and it'll give us a, a couple of numbers here. So on um, 200 responses, um, latency distribution um, on a basic Hello World app coming in um, right under uh, two, 280 milliseconds. So that's that's pretty good. Um, you can see a, a decent amount of that time was spent, um, you know, doing DNS lookups um, and the actual response uh, writing and reading and waiting for that is actually, um, you know, 68, 68 ish milliseconds. Um, I'm reading that right. And a good a good portion of them were in that 75 millisecond range. Um, you know, that's it's not bad for just an unoptimized uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, we have definitely gotten this a lot higher before for the request per second um, in some of our more optimized environments. Um, but yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the demo. That's kind of every, everything up and running. Uh, we've got a Kubernetes cluster running WebAssembly workloads. Um, so. That's all we've got today. Uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in. Um, if you have any questions or want to chat about WebAssembly on Kubernetes, uh, I am on the CNCF Slack, so feel free to reach out. It's um, Jake Luger, uh, and yeah, uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you later.